Thanks, Madonna. Hello, everyone. How are you? Straight after lunch. How good's that? Uh, so I'm going to hit my little timer. I have a commitment to you this afternoon that I will not go over time. I also have a commitment to you that I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint. I'm going to, but I'm going to throw in a little bit of extra value for you and give you the deck to take home with you after or circulate after today's event with a bunch of talking notes for anything that moves a little bit too quickly today. Um, my name's Doug. I'm a whacker from Jalaka which is in Barangum country uh, in Western Downs. Uh, and Jalaka means emu tracks in indigenous language. And um, I was up, came up here a week or so ago and it's the first time up in the territory, beautiful part of the world, really pleased. I've been up um, around Uluru um, and had that experience. It's, um, it's, a, yeah, it's a beautiful part. And um, so nice to reconnect with the indigenous culture up here too. And also learn in my own studies that um, our indigenous culture is no longer alive around the Western Downs in my area. It's the language that's lost. And I think that's a, a real shame, but the only language I know of Jalaka is that it means emu tracks. So uh, anyway, that's all I'll just share that little anecdote with you after my time up here in the last few weeks. Um, I'm an environmental scientist by background, a bachelor in environmental science. So I have a Masters in, in Sustainable Energy Systems um, at Cardiff University in Wales. Spent some time working in the renewable energy industries across the UK. Um, came back to Australia to get back involved in the family business. Um, and so I'm now back in beef production and working with Meat and Livestock Australia. And since being with MLA, have, have knocked over a Masters of Business Administration. And I'm most interested in developing environmental products that deliver a productivity benefit for the sector. But an environmental proposition for the broader community. And that's what I'll talk to you a little bit about today. Um, in my role, I look after investments in weather and climate forecasting products. One of our flagship initiatives is the Northern Australian Climate Program. Um, I also look at um, innovative waste to value products where we convert waste from abattoir processing uh, and feedlots into high value commodities. For example, converting nutrient and phosphorus in wastewater into algal growth for fish food. Um, or converting it into biological based fertilisers for the grains industry. Um, but in, in relation to the Carbon Neutral 2030 initiative, uh, my role is to support the development of new technologies like feed additives, some new tropical forages that persist in the future climates that are going to enable productivity um, and reduce methane emissions per unit of live weight gain, um, and also look at some interesting tree species that might be persistent um, across different parts of the country where appropriate. Um, at the same time, and I think this is probably what's of real interest to you in the room today after a bit of a conversation over breakfast with a couple of you, um, there's genuine interest in just having a carbon conversation. So let's just break it all down. Don't talk to me, Doug, about all the science. Just hit me with me with what's going on in the carbon market at the moment. I don't really understand how I go from where I am today into a carbon market that might enable me to sell carbon credits if I want to to use those carbon credits as part of a branded program like we've seen with the organic beef industry emergence in this part of Australia. What does that look like in a carbon future? Um, and so I will allow uh, plenty of time for those questions to come forth. And, and I know there's some technical questions too about some of the promising feed additives. So plenty of slides which I'm not gonna get through, but what's important is I'm gonna land on a few, talk through a few points, um, and then leave us for some questions. And happy to take questions throughout. Um, if you'd like, but don't ask me a, a hairy question that's going to take lots and lots of minutes and not allow someone else to ask a question. So if you could just think a little bit about the type of question you're going to ask um, and give me a, something that I can answer in a short time frame. Um, so I'm going to keep moving. First thing I want to talk to you about is um, in the cut, this notion of a carbon conversation is understand the difference between carbon, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, which are the three key greenhouse gases that are present in the production of red meat in Australia. So carbon is, is its own element. It's not a carbon dioxide molecule, although it's traded as that. So the science is that carbon is carbon. This is what you see in wood and biomass and pasture. Carbon dioxide is a molecule that's in the atmosphere that's formed when a carbon attaches to two oxygen molecules, oxygen atoms. Um, so that's the first point, is carbon's not necessarily carbon. Um, now, it's called carbon neutral because it's a simplified terminology to explain what is generally a number of gases um, and that are reported under a standard unit of measure. Just as we have a kilogram of live weight gain, the standard unit of measure in the carbon world is a carbon dioxide equivalent unit. 
Um, now, what they do there is equate a bunch of different gases to a standard unit of carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's just an important thing to introduce, and I can appreciate if that goes over your head. It went over my head when I first learned about it, studying my master's in, in the UK about 10 years ago. It took me a little while to get into it. Um, so happy to talk to that in questions. Then when we think about what a carbon neutral definition means, the Australian red meat industry's carbon neutral definition means net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Now that's separate to net zero carbon dioxide emissions, because that's what that is. That's just zero, net zero carbon dioxide emissions from how much we emit versus to how much we pull down through photosynthesis in plants. Not only are we looking at that, we're also looking at, um, at reducing emissions of methane uh, through a byproduct of livestock digestion. The good news is the technologies that enable us to do that avoid methane emissions, which can be useful for productivity purposes alone. So the average animal emits about 90 kilograms of methane. The average cow in a northern breeding system would emit about 90 kilograms of methane per year. In energy terms, that's six to 12 percent of that of the input into that into that cow being lost through the byproduct of, of methane. So if you're running a car and you knew that of the fuel you put in, you look six to 12 percent of it's actually going on the ground. You're not going to be very happy with that. So it's a simplified way of describing what is an opportunity there, which is a production inefficiency. And so the, the drive for innovation in that area is sure it's been driven by reducing methane emissions because that's what the world wants us to do to reduce greenhouse gases. But what's uniquely a unique opportunity for livestock production is that by doing that, we can divert the energy lost in the methane molecule into a productivity pathway for the animal. And any ability we have to do that goes beyond the maintenance of the animal, the maintenance energy requirements of the animal as they walk around the paddocks chasing feed and water. The more methane you capture using a feed additive, um, for example, the, more, the better the opportunity is to convert that into a productivity pathway. So it's a, it's a genuine win-win. Um, so that's just a really important take home message for today is that there's a lot of fear that this is, this is something that's not really an opportunity for the industry and we, wouldn't, we shouldn't only be chasing it or the only benefit is for the environmental, the environmental movement. It's actually not true in our industry. It may be true in others, but it's not true in ours. And so that gives us a lot of faith to continue to invest in this area. Um, there's another greenhouse gas, which is nitrous oxide, but it's not really a problem for us, for our industry. It's, just, it's, it's a potent greenhouse gas, but there's not a lot of it. So the two greenhouse gases that we're focused on in our industry is carbon dioxide through a minimizing fossil fuel use, fossil fuel use, and minimizing the volatilization or the burning and combustion of tree de trees, uh, mostly, through deforestation in some parts of mostly Queensland. Um, that's, the, that's the key source of carbon dioxide emissions from our sector. So deforestation and fossil fuel use. In relation to methane, the majority of methane emissions in our industry are from the breeder herd, um, which is the production unit uh, in Northern Australia. And so anything we can do to help that animal be more productive is gonna reduce methane emissions um, and help us continue to, to feed the world. Now also before I move on, I wanna mention that um, it's not all doom and gloom. The world's not gonna stop eating beef or sheep meat or goat meat because of this issue. We have no insights that that's even remotely true. In fact, in Australia, in our case, we've genuinely only seen massive upside. Productivity or potential upside, some interesting market credentials upside, the fact that you know, of, of globally consumed red meat, we're 1% of the market. And so we've always traded on some unique market attributes, eating quality, safety, biosecurity safety, um, integrity systems. We now have an emerging opportunity for, to, to attach our environmental credentials to the product we sell to high value markets. Um, so there, there is no significant downside. Consumers are not turning away from red meat despite what you might read in sensationalist media. Um, but if over time other industries in Australia or some of the red meat production producing industries in other parts of the world get on top of this issue before we do, you can see that might introduce some interesting trade-off situations for us where our competitors might get access to a high value market in North America or Europe who are looking for product credentials with these traits ahead of us. And market access has what is, is, is one of the single largest drivers for value growth in the Australian red meat industry over the last 20 years. Um, so it is important 
that we keep up with the rate of change, and we're well ahead of it at the moment. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our, how the industry is approaching um, this notion of achieving a carbon neutral position by the year 2030. Um, putting a bit of a project manager's hat on there, we kind of said, how are we going to go about this task? What are the areas that we need to focus on? And our insights are that there's four key areas. Um, the first one is understanding and helping leaders in our industry talk about carbon dioxide, talk about methane, talk about nitrous oxide, have a carbon conversation. So helping leaders understand the science and then have a, a, a common sense conversation with industry and government, customers and consumers, such that we don't get lost in, uh, in the science or lost in emotion when we talk about this issue. Um, so we have a work area that's built around industry leadership. We've got some training courses that are about to be released um, to, for producers this year. We're trialling them internally at the moment. I had one a couple of weeks ago, we've got another one in a fortnight. And so that will help producers get in front of this information and understand it. Um, the second area and the third area are, are, um, are technology focused. So once the industry understands how to talk, let's just give them the technologies and the practices to, to change practice or to try new things. The first area, not surprisingly, is around avoiding emissions. So how do you use a feed additive to avoid methane emissions um, in a northern herd? And we'll come back to that. How do you use genetic technologies to select for animals that are more efficient at uh, net feed intake efficiency, which is the heritable trait you can select for when you purchase a bull today? How do you select for pastures or tropical forages that persist in this environment but might contain natural saponins or tannins? that when ingested by the animal, reduce methane emissions. And so we have done some research um, that's unveiled some interesting plants with those potentials. There's a massive gap in Northern Australia for screening of plants that might naturally occur, that when animals browse on them, um, improves uh, methane emissions conversions. So that's an R&D gap to cover. The other area is around carbon storage. So um, sequestration, carbon sequestration is the process of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and storing it. Carbon storage is something where the carbon remains in a stored form for at least a decade, typically 20 years or more. And the reason why that's important is you need to understand the difference between a flow and a stock. A flow is something that passes into the system and cycles out in, in a yearly basis. And most, most pastures in grazing systems are flows because either the animal eats it or it falls over, or it's burnt. And so the carbon that's in that pasture cycles. It's, it's a flow. It's largely discounted. A stock is something that is, a, is a more of a dense woody biomass that the animal doesn't eat or isn't knocked over um, and, and doesn't kind of decompose over a decade or pushes roots into soils. So another storage pass, pathway for grazing is um, our soils at depths below the oxidation level in the soil, which is typically below 15 centimetres, where oxygen doesn't infiltrate. When oxygen infiltrates, bacteria and microbes can be active, particularly when added with water. They, they eat the roots of the plant, and guess what? It cycles again. So getting it into the depths of soils is good for carbon storage. It's also good for persistence in drought. So it's good to have a plant that can access moisture at depth. And so when you think about technologies for carbon storage and grazing, that's what it is, it's a plant. There's nothing magic. There's no secret source out there and there's no easy silver bullet. It's understanding what plants exist in your environment already and what could be introduced um, that might enable you to either maximise carbon storage or reduce methane emissions because the animal can browse on it as well. Um, and so it's a real win-win win opportunities. And the fourth area um, is what we've called integrated management systems. But that, another way of describing that is, is how do you connect the measurement and reporting of the use of those technologies in emissions avoidance and carbon storage into a farm management tool, for example. And I'll, I will put one slide up on how I'm trying to approach that even in my business at home. And it's by no means an advocate for the particular technologies I'm using. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. So how do you package up your change over time such that you could make a claim to the, to, you, to the person you sell your livestock to or to someone who wants to come into your business and buy that environmental benefit. You need to have a management system for that. Um, and unfortunately, the pocketbook doesn't cut it. Um, I spoke a little bit about some of the avoidance areas. I know the topic of today's presentation was tell us about something for Northern Australia. So I want to 
uh, spend a couple of minutes just highlighting some of the opportunities we're aware of. Um, fires come up a lot in, in today. Um, from an emissions, greenhouse gas emissions perspective, fire management is a tool. And the reason why it's a tool is this notion of a cold versus hot burn. And now I understand there are trade-offs of cold and hot burn around managing biodiversity and other issues, but I'll just stick with the climate science. Under a cool burn, typically under 600 degrees C, you will avoid the formation of nitrogen in the soil attaching to oxygen to form nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. You will also prevent the formation of methane as a byproduct of that combustion process. That's the science. So you're not actually saving carbon because the carbon still cycles. What you're avoiding is the formation of some potent greenhouse gases. That's what is, is driving the climate science around cool versus hot burn. It's an important distinction to be, un, to be aware of. About 10 million hectares of Northern Australia are under Savannah fire management contracts at the moment. Um, I, would, I could easily see that being 100 million by the year 2030. Uh, legumes, the reason why legumes are there is um, there are some na natural saponins and tannins. In two tropical legumes that we have studied to date, there will be others, uh, Lacina and Desmanthus or Desmodium or Pregardis. So all tropical legumes that can persist, you know, I'm not going to say it will persist in this area, I'm not an agronomist and I have no first-hand experience in this, in this area, but there are tropical legumes that in certain parts right across up to the north of Queensland, um, and to southern New South, even into northern New South Wales, that do persist, provide good live weight productivity benefits, and contain those active compounds that reduce methane emissions. Um, so I'd be looking at them. You've obviously got energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies, but when you stack that up as a, on a carbon account for your business, it's a relatively small piece of the pie. Well, not even relatively, it's a very small piece of the pie. 50% of your, of your greenhouse gas emissions in a livestock production system are enteric methane from the breeder herd. Um, this is, you know, these areas are about 5%, but they're good to have because they're an operating cost for the business and, and, and avoid any long-standing issues around access to oil and diesel. Um, genetics and husbandry practices, also relatively well used in northern herds. The most advanced breed society on that issue is Angus. Angus Breed Society have a net feed intake efficiency attribute. Um, now, obviously it needs to be selected along a basket of genetics, genetic attributes you're selecting for. It should not be the sole attribute. You obviously need to think about what you're supplying in the market, but you can select that today. Um, also looking at, uh, on relation to, um, uh, in relation to husbandry practices, some of you may have become aware of the beef herd management method. Um, it's, a, it's a methodology you can follow, which is a blueprint that says, if I manage my herd this particular way, I'm going to increase productivity and I'm going to avoid methane emissions because my animals are either turned off quicker, they're not on my farm as long as they have been, or they're more productive. So they're making better use of available feed. That leaves you with, on a carbon market value, it's about four or $5 a head benefit in, 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 if you were to sell that as a carbon credit. The massive benefit, which is put another zero on that easily, is the herd productivity benefits. You're just going to have a far more productive herd. Um, so that's what we mean when we say genetics and husbandry practices. Um, veg management is um, avoided clearing in this particular instance. So it's avoiding deforesting because the assumption is you deforest, falls on the ground, you burn it, it burns at relatively hot temperature because it's dense woody biomass. Not only do you release CO2, but you'll likely release nitrous oxide and methane. Um, so when we say avoid it in this context, it means avoiding the loss of those emissions. And livestock supplements, which gets all the, the hot press. Um, so the red algae, the life-saving red algae for the industry, there's a competing product which is called 3-nitroxypropanol, which is a synthetically produced molecule um, from a Dutch pharmaceutical company, which you, you will be able to buy in Australia next year before you'll be able to get access to the red asparagopsis, um, which inhibits methane can, um, formation in the rumen. They're actually different modes of action, so the way in which these two compounds operate is actually different. The chemical pathway is different, um, and they've been engineered differently. However, they are genuine prospects for producers. Um, we're, we're a bit more certain about the 3NOP, or Bovier, B-O-V-A-E-R, product trade name and its credentials at this point than we are Red Asparagopsis, only because they've been in, um, in investing in that product for 20 years. So they're a little way ahead of it. Um, now, 
I, I'm, my time's gone, so what I want to do now is um, just leave you with 10 things you can do today and then we'll go to some questions. Um, so always kind of use this in a, in a producer forum or even a farm advisors forum. Here are our insights about what things you could do today if you wanted to engage in this, in this initiative. The first thing is um, obviously arm yourself with the right knowledge. Knowledge is power. Um, you don't have it, you'll make bad decisions. So make sure you get the right knowledge in front of you. And a good place to start is to develop a carbon account. That's a hyperlink to our website. So it is, all of this information is on our website, www.mla.com.au forward slash CN30, or just try MLA CN30 or Carbon Neutral, it'll come up as a web page. You can download tools there to play around with a carbon account. If you've got someone personally or in your family who knows Microsoft Excel, you can input your farm data. The data you put in is the same data you provide to the ATO, largely. So it's the same way approaching your business management. You need to know livestock numbers, herd type, um, the breakup of composition of the herd, what you produced in a particular year, what you bought in, what you sold, and other inputs. That's the basis of the carbon account. Then you overlay that with any spatial data you may have um, about your vegetation type. So what vegetation do you have? Did you have at the beginning of the year and the end of the year? Consider herd management, uh, herd or flock management practices. So you know, really understand your genetics and understand and be honest with yourself about how productive your herd is. Selecting for breeder efficiency, selecting for fertility, making sure your weaning rates are high as they can be. Because it's important that you're producing with the inputs you have. Because no matter how many breeds you have running around, they're gonna be consuming the same amount of inputs. They're all gonna be releasing 90 kilograms of methane uh, per year on average. So you wanna make sure that when they're doing that, they're also producing a calf, and that calf's getting a market. Um, energy efficiency, renewable energy technologies are relatively straightforward. Solar's the big one up here, not surprisingly. Um, identifying shade and shelter options, limited potential for that to some extent here. Um, these are national, and national tips, so to speak, and so obviously acknowledging that you've got some limitations in the tree options for shade and shelter, and even establishment options. Um, consider the potential for savannah fire management methods. You should definitely check that out. And the NAFI information source has been incredibly useful for anyone running a, 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 a um, fire management project in Northern Australia. It's, it is a very useful resource. Check out some um, uh, dung beetle species population. So anyone interested in dung beetles out in the field? Is anyone, yeah, they are. We're yet to kind of wrap this up in science. Anecdotal evidence suggests that they do provide some really useful benefits for me avoiding emissions and improving carbon storage. We just have, we're actually in the process now of trying to get some science around that to firm that up so that we know if you've got this beetle in this area, in this level of population, you might be able to then make some claim about avoided emissions or carbon storage. Um, I'm nearly there. Uh, the plan for the delivery of new feeds and supplements. So, Anyone in the room supplementing at the moment? Livestock at any stage in the year? If you're a producer, no, no supplementation at all? Supplementation? Phosphorus, lick blocks, dry lick, yeah. So it'll be those same delivery mechanisms that will incorporate these compounds into them. So you will see in the not too distant future, those companies now offer these compounds as part of that delivery mechanism. Um, so plan for that. You know, start to think about what that could look like in your business. And if you're not supplementing at the, at, in the dry seasons and in the lead up to, to joining, you probably should be. You definitely should be thinking about it because you're leaving value on the table. Establishing deep-rooted um, uh, deep rooted palatable pastures and legumes. Now, generally speaking, there is a trade-off between a C4 grass, that is a tropical grass that grows quickly, has a lot of lignin, in it versus the cellulose, which is the starch sugar stuff that enables productivity. There's generally a trade-off of that. However, there are opportunities to look through science and innovation, look at selecting and developing species that have C4 attributes because they're highly productive, push roots deep into the soil, persist throughout droughts and enable you to put carbon in soil, but then have it be palatable and useful for livestock production. And there are some species that offer multiple benefits. And then look at collaborative supply chain initiatives. One of the best and most well-known collaborative supply chain initiatives in the industry is OB Organic. A bunch of producers came together and said, you know what, I think we've got some comparative and competitive advantage in this part of the world. We're clean, 
We don't use chemical inputs. It could be some similar opportunities around carbon. You don't have to be carbon neutral. You could be low carbon. You could just be better than where you were. And I think there's some real opportunity in that. If, if, if you work together at scale, you only need a handful of businesses with you know, five or 10,000 breeders in them to have a pretty decent supply chain. Um, you can have a story to tell. So look at those collaborative supply chain initiatives. I'm going to stop there. Thank you.